Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 14, Episode 105. He's Dave Brian. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Friday, Steelers Nation. Dave, how you doing? How's that bracket looking on the first day of March Madness? <laughs> who was your winner? Did you pick UConn or who, who was your winner this year? Uh, yeah, I have uh, I got UConn winner at all, but the team I have them facing in the final game is now out of it. And, really? Uh, yeah, Kentucky? yeah I, I had Kentucky going oh, no. uh, uh, all the way. So obviously uh, uh, that side of the bracket's already busted there. I'm going to have to hope that I, I pick a lot of games up until – uh, that point, I, I did fairly well overall on on on, and I'm sure everybody's tuning in to hear about Dave's bracket this That's morning. That's what I'm but, here uh, for. Uh, Thursday, I, I I think only lost like uh, two or three games out of the bunch, but uh, one of them cost me uh, the team that I had in the national championship game there. So uh, anyway, I thought it was uh, some entertaining games yesterday. Look, I don't know jack about uh, <laughs> college back basketball, but it was fun to see Duquesne uh, win, even though. Uh, 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 Kentucky got knocked out. It, it's fun. Those uh, those Cinderella, although don't call them Cinderella, <laughs> uh, Oakland stories are fun. I mean, th- th- those things are always fun. So it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, on the second day on Friday uh, for the uh, for the tournament action there. And I'm taking Iowa State. Why? I have no idea. I just picked them late Wednesday night. So the Cyclones are my team this year. All right, Dave, let's jump into the Steelers discussion. And no surprise, despite the March Madness Day of Surprises, the Pittsburgh Steelers brass is in Michigan for Friday's Pro Day. You know, there's some other, you know, competing Pro Days today, Florida State, but all signs based on history indicated Pittsburgh was going to be at Michigan. We know Mike Tomlin, Omar Khan, Arthur Smith, Terrell Austin, and likely others are as well. 18 players from Michigan went to the Combine, ton of prospects this year. Um, obviously, it's J.J. McCarthy, the quarterback, is the, the, the highest to be drafted, not of interest to the Steelers, but they could look at names like wide receiver Roman Wilson, cornerback Mike Sandra still, defensive lineman Chris Jenkins Jr., linebacker Junior Colson, and a host of others. So again, no surprise to see Pittsburgh's top names in Michigan for their pro day. Alex, I'm going to go out on a limb and say the Steelers draft a player from Michigan this year. It's almost, it feels like the entire draft is Michigan <laughs> men. So yeah, I like your odds there. Uh, look, I mean, uh, you look at uh, some of these guys specifically that uh, we've been talking about that fit the Steelers and uh, what ones that were even mentioned in the, in the post this morning, uh, Roman Wilson, Mike Sandra still uh, Chris Jenkins, uh, all three of those guys are fit uh, fits. I, I, you know, Roman Wilson and Mike Sandra still just really, uh, when you dig deep into into their backgrounds and all like that, the character and 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 everything related to that, th- those guys really really seem like uh, the kind of players that quote unquote the Steelers want, you know, and need and 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 that sort of thing there. And both those guys play are uh, play positions that you know at this point considered needs. I, I think for this team uh, heading into the draft. Uh, so yeah, I mean, look, I, you know, you increase your odds when you talk about it. Wasn't it a record number that the school sent 18, mm-hmm. uh, to the combine, uh, this year. I mean, obviously we wound up being the national champions and, uh, it's, it's, you know, the Steelers are at that pro day almost every year. That's not a surprise there, but yeah, I mean, I, it, Look, I'm having fun with it. It's not going really going out on a limb uh, to predict that a guy might come out of here. But, you know, I, I, I really do uh, firmly believe that you'll see someone on Michigan uh, drafted, you know, by the Steelers here next month. Sure. A uh, strong possibility of that. And although we do talk a lot about the names we just mentioned, Wilson, San Ristil, et cetera, there's quality really at any position throw a dart and you'll find a position where, Mich- where Michigan 
will offer something. This draft, a bunch of offensive linemen. Now, those might be later round guys or Pittsburgh's targeting some earlier round guys. Uh, Zach Zinter, really probably one of the best guards in this class, broke his leg late last year. That's kind of, you know, holding him back. But, you know, Drake Nugent, highly experienced center, you know, later round type guy, like Darius Henderson, experienced guard and tackle. So even outside the the obvious names and kind of the more, you know, day two type of names, there's still talent and depth throughout with this Michigan team. Absolutely, there is. Uh, and it's going to be going to be, you know, several of these guys obviously going to go early in the draft first two, three, uh, four rounds. Be interesting to see where uh, I mean, it sounds like, you know, the quarterback with uh, J.J. McCarthy is going to go in the first round. And I, I guess people speculate within the first top 10 picks, I guess. Yeah, it could. It, it seems to be sooner than later with McCarthy. It was drawn buzz and, um, you know, done well, I think, in the, the pre-jab process. And although he was supported by a great cast at Michigan, you watch the tapes and the situation of football where he had to make plays, uh, he made plays. And so I think the, the thinking is at worst, he'll be the fourth quarterback off the board behind Williams and May and Daniels. And then McCarthy being fourth, he could be even higher than that. Maybe he jumps Drake May. We'll have to to wait and see obviously not uh, a possibility or a conversation piece for Pittsburgh, but uh, the, the top Michigan uh, player at the pro day today. Uh, Dave, what, what else here for a pro day tracker and kind of keeping tabs on where this team is at some positional coaches. We had talked about on the Wednesday show, haven't seen a ton of the positional coaches kind of getting our wish here. New wide receivers coach, Zach Azani at Texas, uh, Aaron Curry at Ohio state for, they're up all linebacker, Tommy Eichenberg. And so we'll see what happens today with Florida State and who else might be brought to Michigan. But starting to see the positional coaches bounce around a bit. Yeah, we have a uh, quarterback coach uh, spotted at uh, South Alabama, right? Right. Tom Marth down there for Carter Bradley. And it seems like, are we missing? Let's see. We have not seen Dunbar out on the road yet, I do not believe. Uh, have we seen, I mean, obviously we've seen Terrell Austin. Have we seen, uh, any, any other, uh, defensive coach other besides than, Curry? Yeah. Besides Curry. No, I have not. We'll see who's there today. We'll see if Grady Brown goes to Michigan. I believe he was there last year. I was going to ask you too, on Michigan, they have a ton of talent, ton of names. We mentioned a bunch of them. If you had to plant your flag on one name, and if I told you, Dave, they are going to draft one Michigan Mike, Wolverine. Mike Sandra still. <laughs> nah, that's my answer as well, Sandra still. Uh, and it, it's felt like that since, I think, like the combine and her, hearing him talk and all like that. Look, really, the only, the only thing I think kind of negative to find on him is just his overall size. But, man, do they need a guy, a physical slot, you know, uh, uh, all purpose, uh, physical guy, you know, to, 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 to play sub package. And he, I mean, his tape is fantastic. It really is. And, and once again, I think other than him being undersized, I mean, that, 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 that seems to be the only, one of the only real clear knocks on him. And for slot corner, that lack of size will hurt him less than if he was an outside corner in Pittsburgh. Right. For example, Mike Hilton, not a big dude, but you have the ball production, the receiver background, the, the run game impact, their pedigree, uh, the testing overall. He tested well, you know, despite the lack of size. To me, that's a guy that's checking every single box. And oh, yeah, they have no slot corner on right. this roster right now with experience. And so that is a screaming need for this Pittsburgh Steelers team. Yeah, I wish he was a, a, at least, you know, Five ten or so, but I mean five five foot nine and three eights, one hundred eighty two pounds. I mean he's he, he's put together, you know, mm -hmm. uh, overall. And as you as you said, man, he tested uh, off the charts there. He's got great character. I believe he was a one or two time captain uh, there as well too. They and and to hear him talk, he is he's phenomenal. Uh, he a lot of teams are going to like him. Uh, this could be late second round or one of the two third round picks for the Steelers here. That sounds about right on Sandra still, but yeah, going back to the positional coaches, broadly speaking, I'm surprised though Dunbar so far. I mean, I'm trying to think, you know, we'll see if he's there today for Jenkins. I guess LSU hasn't had their pro day. The Baylor is going to be part of that big 12, you know, combined pro day next week. So, you know, we'll see about, some of that uh, in terms of the more notable defensive linemen in this class, but don't think it was a Clemson, which surprised me a little bit. So 
given the need to D line, I thought I would see Dunbar maybe once or twice already. Yeah, he is up there in age, though. And but I mean, he, uh, I don't know. You you do circle back to last year. Who was the uh, who was the Bowling Green kid that he worked out? Carl Brooks. Right, uh, right, Brooks. That was last year, right? Mm-hmm. The last year. Yeah. Didn't we didn't we spot him somewhere else uh, last year as well too? It seemed like we spotted him twice last uh, year. I can check. I'm sure he did. Yeah, Brooks ended up being a decent player for the Packers. Right. Kind of kind of kind of late round uh, for for them. Now they they brought in some defense linemen that we'll talk about, and so maybe that's you know one component of it. Um, and, and, and positional coaches don't go to typically you know seven schools like Tomlin and Khan. Usually it's two or three, you know, depending but, but, on, on, but it's and, notable when they show up though. And oh, yeah. it has been in the past when it comes to the draft. Oh yeah. I mean, it's an obvious sign of interest. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I say that my surprise about Dunbar not appearing in a lot of places, you know, he may show up at two more places throughout the rest of this process, rest of the month. And, and that kind of checks that box last year. We have him at Clemson Bowling Green and Western Kentucky when they had their big D tackle brought up Martin uh, come out of the draft. Okay. All right. So, yeah, again, typically positional coaches, you know, two or three will we'll certainly keep tracking it. Um, Azani at Texas, they got their two guys down there and A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Worthy reporting is that Worthy met with, I assume, Azani after the pro day workout for an extensive period of time. The guy that ran the fastest combine in combine history, you know, could that be in play for Pittsburgh potentially? Man, and uh, I, I mean, he he's got all the buzz on him, obviously coming out of combine and all like that. But I mean, can you see this team drafting another light receiver, even though he's fast as hell? And I mean, it, it feels like it would have been. It, it feels like potentially the other Texas wide receiver is the one that they they uh, they should be paying more attention to in uh, uh, Adonai Mitchell. Sure. He's kind of more of the power forward looking type that's 6'2", 220 plus. That seems to fit the type Pittsburgh's targeting a bit more than worthy. But again, speed is speed. And to have that element is something the Steelers really haven't had consistently since, you know, Martavis Bryant, although different body type, Mike Wallace, who was bigger than worthy, but just kind of that, that game breaker. And you talk about you know, how beneficial explosive and chunk plays are, Worthy's going to offer those. Right. I mean, but I mean, you're talking about another smaller smaller receiver that probably not going to help you much in the in 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 you know in the run game how often are you going to be able to get them on the field yada yada sure no i get that yeah i i think it's less likely i think i'm leaning towards day two for them taking a receiver based on some of the pre-draft visitors and just other general interest is kind of where i've shifted towards right now uh but if you do want to say from a run game standpoint you know if you're if you're a team facing a guy like worthy how much, how much single high do you play against a guy with that kind of speed? You play more too high and protect your cornerbacks. So they're not one-on-one against the fastest man in football. That may have a uh, kind of inherent benefit to improving your run game. Yeah, much like Miami, right? Speed scares, you know, mm-hmm. so speed, uh, sp- speed must be defended. Sure. So you're right. As a blocker, it probably won't offer much. But in terms of the threat, maybe it changes the defensive structure. But again, we'll see what happens. There are a ton of receivers in this class. We're trying to pick out one name will be difficult to do. And I agree. I think more likely it's going to be one of those bigger body types and it is going to be a smaller kind of, you know, what worthy and his, and his build offers, but notable all the same. Any other pro day uh, recapping that we should be doing that I'm missing here, Dave? Uh, damn it. You've hit uh, most of it, haven't you? Yeah, I think I have anything I missed. Uh, we'll, we'll come back on Monday. And of course, a pretty active day Friday for the state, Michigan, and a couple of other schools. Speaking of the draft, Pittsburgh, uh, they're not officially announcing their uh, uh, 30 visits, the, the, the pre draft visitors that come into the facility this year, which is a bit disappointing. At least they have not done so so far. But we know a couple names being reported out already in defense alignment Darius Robinson from Missouri, offensive tackle Travis Glover from Georgia State. Ricky uh, Persall from Florida, uh, Malachi Corley, the receiver from Western Kentucky, wide receiver Xavier Leggett from South Carolina, and offensive tackle uh, Talese Fuega from uh, Oregon State. Uh, these are you know top round one, round two type of guys, bunch of receivers coming in. Uh, and then Darius Robinson, who we talked about way back early in the pre job mm-hmm. process and kind of a name we first identified. Uh, yeah, Robinson is an interesting fit. The the deeper you get into his film and all like that, uh, uh, you know, what, what do you do with him? You know, uh, he's athletic as all get out, but it feels like he's, he's, he lacks some sand in his pants and it feels like you kind of wonder, is this another tweener? Is this DeMarvin? Is that, you know, is this another DeMarvin Leal type? 
I mean, look, when it first first time when I uh, read the initial stuff on him, I kind of envisioned him. I, I think his weight was listed at three. I don't know. What was it? Three oh two, three oh four. I forget exactly. Um, uh, but I, I was I because of his measurables alone, I was excited to turn on the tape. And it's not that the tape is awful on him. It's just it, it, he's a different kind of player than kind of what I envisioned he would be based on his measurables there. But uh, uh, an interesting fit nonetheless. And, you know, they 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 uh, uh, this is a guy that was what at the senior bowl here. So they're getting to know uh, in this process. It just. Overall, when when you dig deeper into his tape and all, it feels like oh man, it just it feels like a a, a, a weird fit there. So, uh, but there is interest there, and we have to pass that along, especially when when he makes it as far as being brought in for a pre draft visit. Sure, from a body type standpoint, he's not quite as big and and sick as you would probably think and hope for when you're talking about a you know three tech four eye where the Steelers defensive ends typically a line uh but I, I think on tape he's strong he's got a violent punch he can play the run and he's a guy i wrote the report on but i would probably have to go back to more of his 2022 tape because he, he he was a defensive tackle until his final year at missouri then he kind of slimmed down kicked out and played some more end and so maybe pittsburgh's trying to look at his you know prior to 2023 tape to project out how we'll fit in the system right yeah that's but, possible um, interesting name. And again, it's hard to find that type, that body type. There's a scarcity to it. And Robinson at some level does check that with his height, his great length. And I do think he plays to run well. I think he has you know, good upper body strength. So we'll, hey, for, uh, for a guy that comes off and for a guy, his size too, when, when you, when you watch him come off the end, I mean, he's got some bend to him. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's a, he can move for a big guy. Yeah. Yeah, certainly can. Uh, Glover's a guy that I've talked about a little bit and somebody yeah. uh, on my radar, not early round guy. We're talking day three type of player, but Pittsburgh has shown a lot of interest in Georgia State offensive tackle Travis Glover. Uh, he was a senior bowl midweek edition, got coached by Isaac Williams for the American side, uh, the Steelers assistant offensive line coach. Then Williams and Dan Colbert was at his Georgia State Pro Day on Monday, and now he's in for a visit. I think officially had his visit on Thursday. So I compared this in terms of the interest for a relative small schooler. I know Georgia State is FBS or Sunbelt. It's not uh, Hargrave in South Carolina State. That's, you know, FCS, but still not a, a non-Power 5 conference, not a big school, quote unquote. But I compared kind of the interest in Hargrave to what they're showing in Glover, where you know, Hargrave was a, a senior bowl week, midweek ad for injury reasons, had a really good week of practice. John Mitchell goes down to South Carolina State and watches him. Hargrave comes in for a pre draft visit, becomes Pittsburgh's third round pick in 2016. I'm not calling Glover the next Hargrave, but I'm talking about just in the way that Pittsburgh is showing interest in these smaller school guys. They don't typically, you know, dive into those waters. And so when they do and show this level of consistent heavy interest, it is to me very notable. Uh, how, how deep have you gone into him? I've gotten two games on him last night. I'll have the report up uh, for the morning on Saturday for Steelers Depot. To me, my my initial thought is he's a guard, actually. I don't think he has the feet to play tackle. Now, he has played guard before. He's played both left tackle, right tackle, and left guard. Um, he's a little too stiff, a little too rigid, so I think he'll have to kick inside. Okay, interesting there. Uh, were you thinking you're going to find something else there? I thought I would see a little better athlete overall. Now, I don't know. Maybe Pittsburgh will still project him out of tackle. He's got size. He's got length. Um, and, and there's some um, some upper body strength to his game. And as a down blocker in the run game, he's very effective. And I got to go back and watch some of his guard tape. I got a uh, North Carolina game on tap. I got to watch here later tonight when he was playing left guard to kind of see how that looked compared to, to tackle. But more developmental guy. We're not talking about somebody that will start week one, but right. somebody that could, you know, be that, you know, they got two six round picks. That could be where Glover fits in. I got you. All right. And then with the receivers in Pearsall, Corley, and Leggett, we're talking round two, likely. I think we're talking like 51st overall pick, generally speaking, maybe a little bit later on Corley. Um, but again, kind of size, physicality, yards after the catch. You know, Leggett's very explosive, very good in the open field. I question his separation ability. Corley's kind of this stockier build, a little bit shorter, but thickly build. And Pearsall's kind of this more, you know, I don't know if Pickens is the best comparison to make, but more outside, you know, power forward, jump ball type of receiver. 
I tell you, that Corley is uh, uh, fun to watch after the catch for sure. I think he's the one that's been uh, uh, widely compared to Debo Samuel throughout the process and all. Uh, really a, a, a physical guy, especially after the catch. I don't think he did anything at the combine, though, did he? Didn't even measure in, which uh, was interesting. Uh, yeah, that was interesting with him. And then, yeah, I watched a little bit of uh, Leggett. I uh, obviously know quite a bit about the uh, the Florida wide receiver in uh, uh, – oh, Ricky Pearsall as well, too, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can see them being attracted to Pearsall, but uh, I, I, I was, I, I did find myself looking for Zach uh, 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 Zaney uh, uh, at the Florida Pro Day, but did uh, I think only one person from from the Steelers was there at that Florida Pro Day, right? Yeah, that was Tozen Kazim, who was listed as a football analyst, but has done some scouting as well. But Pearsall did not work out, so I imagine Zani okay. didn't make that trip because there probably wasn't much to see. He's coming in for a visit, so you can just get to know him uh, at the facility. All right. So, uh, look, I mean, we know they're looking at wide receivers in this draft and they're going to draft, you know, at least one, if not two in this class. And I'm thinking probably with that either 51st pick, the second round pick or that first third round pick, I think it's where receivers going to come in. First round still possible. I've talked that up before. Brian Thomas, maybe A.D. Mitchell. Those are names in the conversation. Maybe one of those guys comes in for a visit at some point, but just based on you know, Pearsall, Corley, Leggett, I think those are more round two type of guys. And just given some of the needs at other positions, I'm kind of thinking, and again, drafts are fluid and depends on the board and all these other factors. But I'm just kind of guessing right now, round two for wide receiver, which is typically their sweet spot. They're a day two draft a receiver type of team. And look, they, they still got the LSU pro day on 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 tap with with uh, Brian Thomas. You still have the uh, Odunze Washington pro day uh, forthcoming. So we'll, we'll have to see who shows up there and and how many more of these uh, pre-draft visitors at, uh, at the wide receiver position they bring in. And then with the final name to mention here, I think it's Fuwaga, 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 the the Oregon State tackle, probably first round guy that hasn't gotten as much buzz in this deep tackle class, but a name that should be considered. Uh, Absolutely, he should be, and especially when now I think the in in the arms a little bit, thirty three and eighth. Where does that stack up? I mean, the benchmark is typically viewed as 33. Pittsburgh's tackles under Pat Meyer typically have more of the above average to really, you know, impressive length. Broderick Jones is 34 and a quarter, 34 and three quarters. I think Dan Moore's 34 ish. And so that's a little bit on the shorter side for Pittsburgh. Okay. Um, but still a name to to mention all the same in that again, that that deep tackle pool where Pittsburgh should have options should they want to go there. But again, I do think center is going to be higher on their list of needs to address before we get to offensive tackle. All right. Interesting that the Steelers aren't announcing those this year, right? Or it doesn't seem to be. Doesn't seem to be disappointing, um, but we're, we're, we're getting some information and we'll hopefully have as many names of the allotted 30 as possible. The tracker is up on Steelers Depot. All right, Dave, uh, let, let's talk about just kind of something uh, Steelers adjacent related here on cornerback Cam Sutton, now released by the Detroit Lions. I have not followed the entire story, you know, chapter and verse, but uh, essentially he's wanted by police. There's a warrant out for his, his arrest for an incident with a woman on March 7th, where I believe he's being accused of you know domestic battery and strangulation. Don't know all the details there, but essentially what we do know is that Sutton has not been located. He's on the run from police. There was a, a warrant out for his arrest for a domestic situation now released by the Lions yesterday. And this is just the story where it comes out of nowhere. I mean, it's just it, it, it's it's hey, you mean you're mad about it. You're sad about it for, for the whole circumstances. Sutton seemed like to, to be like the, the model guy in Pittsburgh to hear this story is really disappointing. Yeah, well, I can't help but think back all the way back to before he was drafted and Mike Tomlin and Kevin Colbert talking about going out there to uh, where Tennessee and uh, uh, I, I think ahead of the pro day and putting them on the board and how he knew all the position, you know, just a, a smart guy. And, uh, you could really understand the, the fit and, uh, you know, why he ended up being a draft pick and all like that. And, you know, obviously, you know, uh, a career in, in Pittsburgh, uh, I, I thought better than average overall. I mean, really was, was, was beneficial in being able to move around, especially, uh, during his final time there. And a guy that we talked about thinking, 
man, did this, did the Steelers make the right decision in in letting him walk off into free agency last uh, a year ago, and uh, the money was a little bit more than you know. Uh, uh, than what the Steelers wanted to pay, along with the guarantees filtering over into that second year. That's probably another good reason uh, why they lost him to the Lions. Uh, I would have never predicted that uh, this would have been what we would been talk, talk what we would have would be talking about a year later uh, in 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 you know in free agency here with with Cameron Sutton, and it really is a sad story. And it goes from I mean, this thing went from you know zero to you know, 60 real, real quick. You know, you, you, the, uh, the story popped up from the, uh, from the, what Hillsborough, her, her, what, what sheriff's department was it? The, uh, I think uh, yeah, Hills, Hillsborough. Yeah. Like Hillsborough that. County Sheriff's department on Wednesday. I think that was the 20th. What day was the 20th? It was Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday. And then it goes from that to, and you, you know, you're talking about an incident at that point. It was all almost already two, two weeks old. And then the Lions re, re, released a statement saying that you know they were they were aware of the situation, looking into it. And then you get to Thursday, and they released him. And then the reports about uh, how he's probably is off the field uh, issue in this circumstance is probably done enough for for the Lions to cancel out that fully guaranteed ten and a half million uh, base salary that he had in two thousand twenty four. So. I mean, he's there's a good chance that Cameron Sutton play, has played his last snap in the NFL at this point. Now you you obviously with him not being found yet, you kind of concerned about his 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 personal safety as well too and his well being. So uh, here's here's the hope and all this plays out in whatever whatever best way possible at this point. But yeah, I I I, I certainly wouldn't have had this you know on the old bingo card you know, a year ago when he left the Steelers to sign with the Lions. You're just watching a guy not only throw his career away, but potentially throwing his life away for this heinous, you know, crime that he's been accused of and now on the run, which brings a whole other host of, of legal matters and, and issues. So hopefully he's found and, and arrested. And of course, he'll get his stay in court. But um, obviously the accusations are very heavy and we don't know all the, the circumstances and and what's going on uh, obviously but for him to be on the run after this uh, signifies that uh, he knows that uh, something happened and and again hopefully he's he's found and and arrested and you know, the legal proceedings begin from there yeah and found safe hopefully so uh yeah you look you never know what what happens behind closed doors with people you know Right, right. So we'll uh, we'll update you whenever they do end up finding Cam Sutton. But again, still apparently on the run from police for the last heck, almost going on three weeks at this point. So uh, that's the news there with Cam Sutton. Um, to make a very poor segue into other Steelers, you know, former Steelers cornerback related news, James Pierre signing a one year deal with the Washington Commanders. That news broke yesterday. Pierre undrafted for agent. Uh, out of uh, Florida Atlantic, I believe it was in 2020. Um, quality gunner just had the talent to play corner, you know, physically, but above the net technique, just so frustrating to watch. and was never able to earn the trust of the coaching staff to really see consistent defensive playing time unless they had to play him in previous years due to injury. Yeah, but really good gunner. <laughs> yeah, he was. As, you, uh, as you mentioned there, uh, and your other gunner, Miles Boykin, is a is a free agent as well, too, and unsigned at this point. So uh, we can see a couple of new gunners out there uh, for the for the Steelers in 2024. And might Darius Rush have a shot at being one of those? Certainly. Um, he did that at South Carolina. He was an accomplished special teamer, even in his final year with the Gamecocks. He was still playing gunner and playing on special teams. So uh, th there could be two open paths for whoever is battling for those final couple of roster spots to, to state their case and cement their spot on the roster. Right. Um, so that's the book on James P. Air. Davis, give us a, give us a cap update with everything that's been going on here with Pittsburgh the last, uh, last week or so. Yeah, we had the, finally the, uh, contract for, 
uh, Deshaun Elliott come in, and that was a, a little off of what I projected. Not much uh, overall there. Look, I mean, it's hard to miss when you know that it's a two-year, six million dollar uh, deal. You just got to uh, uh, where where you put the numbers and all like that uh, matter. But that ended up being an evenly split contract, meaning that uh, Watson will earn, I mean, uh, Elliott will earn $3 million this year and another $3 million scheduled to earn in 2025. I believe his cap number for 2024 came in at $2.25 million right around in there. Uh, the only contract that we're not 100% on uh, as we sit here on this Friday is that of Van Jefferson, the wide receiver uh, that was signed recently. We strongly or I strongly believe that that's going to be a veteran benefit uh, contract with probably the max uh, signing bonus of just under 170000 but we do not know for sure as of yet, but uh, uh, with with Ex extrapolating that out and, and pretending as if Jefferson did sign that one year veteran benefit contract uh, and knowing the contract of Elliott, I have this team at 14.965, almost 966, 14.966 million under the cap as we sit here right now in real time. So that's uh, obviously a lot of cap space to do. You know, things with uh, the rest of free agency, especially at this stage. Now, we did talk and entertain the plausibility factor of trading for a guy like uh, Brandon Ayuk the other day. And uh, based on my calculations still with and, and, and based on the cap number that uh, Brandon Ayuk currently carries, you could plausibly at this very moment trade for him, fit that cap number underneath the cap, turn around and do an extension with him, and then uh, be back in 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 good shape again. Uh, obviously, we don't know if that that's going to happen, but that 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 lets you know how much cap space is actually left. Look, going forward with this thing at this point and at this stage in free agency right now. I mean, we're more than, uh, you know, we're, we're what, a week and a half into the new league year uh, at this point. And there's been a, you know, even though this is tr this is slowed to a trickle as far as signings around the league. At this point, Alex, I'd be surprised if we're talking about big numbers with any. I think they're still going to sign players. I just think that most of the guys that you're going to see at this point are going to be. You know, if we're talking any any type of, of 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 you know large number at all, that that large number in the Steelers' eyes would probably be an APY of around six or seven million. I don't think you're going to see a lot of big cap hits come in uh, for 2024 at this point when it comes to uh, you know the remainder of free agency here. And then when once you factor in offset in the rule of 51. You're really talking about the needle not moving a, a, a lot here. Now, I will say this at this point here. Uh, when you look at what this team has done, Patrick Queen was a hell of a splash, right? I mean, that that mm -hmm. when you talk about uh, cash spent in 2024 and a number at 13.84, I mean, that's a big splash in this uh, here. When you talk about the, the, the overall splashiness of the quarterback position. Yeah, Russell Wilson, his salary is, is dirt cheap, but, I mean, that's a big name there. When you talk about this team trading for Justin Fields, uh, not so much the cap hit, but the actual idea that they did it. Uh, the bringing in uh, the, the whole uh, – uh, Dante Jackson for Deontay Johnson was a splash. You actually gained cap space and cash in that uh, overall when you look at it when the dust settled there. Um, Outside of that, though, it 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 hasn't been as active from from kind of those points. In other words, these last four or five days haven't been as active as kind of what I envisioned it might be. I kind of thought you might see two or three other, you know, lower level four or five. Six million dollar APY kind of players brought into this point, but it it has been real quiet since essentially. Who was the last guy? Van Jefferson was the last announcement, wasn't it? 
Uh, I believe so. I mean, Justin Fields was the last player acquired in the trade over the weekend, but I think in terms of free agent signing, Jefferson was, I believe, one week ago. Right. So, and, you know, if you want to talk about, we've talked about cash spending and what that might look like for this team uh, this offseason here and in free agency period specifically here. Uh, I, I, I threw out a number about, you know, what I thought 40 million, uh, in total. And if you look at everything that's been done and here's one thing that I, I played around with was look, no, I, I did not predict that we'd be talking about a, De, a, a Deontay Johnson for Dante Jackson trade and then saving $4 million cash. Uh, in 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 the process there. I uh, also did not see what was essentially a Justin Fields for Kitty Pickett trade. <laughs> I mean, if you want to map it out, that's mm-hmm. kind of uh, you know what 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 happened there. Uh, if you want to look at cash spending, and in other words, the byproduct, and this includes offsets too of players that that you've signed. And replacing players within the top, let's say 53, not necessarily 51, because we're not talking about cap here. We're talking about cash here. I have a difference of of once free agency starting here, an offset of this team spending $21.6 million in cash additionally. Now, once again, you have an offset of Deontay Johnson for Deontay Johnson and saving four million there. And then, you know, everything else, you know, uh, uh, offset the roster there. Technically, it, it, uh, it, 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 it's equaling out to this team spending an additional $21.6 million in cash so far. You got to remember Patrick Queen's cash number was 13.84 uh, minus whatever uh, your know, offset was in that. So most of that revolves around Patrick Queen. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think it's been a good offseason overall. I've liked almost all the moves that Pittsburgh has actually made. I still don't love the Deontay Johnson deal. I understand the situation they, they probably felt like they were in. Maybe Deontay didn't really want to be here and the roster bonus coming due was, you know, creating a leverage point for them. But I do think this team still has a bunch of holes left in the roster they right. have to address. Now, I do think they, of course, will add some more free agents, as you said, not likely to be you know, high end slam dunk starter type of guys, but they will add people and, if, and the draft is going to be obviously a place where they can replenish and, and, and build upon as well. But we talk about center. There's nothing there. Receiver opposite of Pickens right now. There's nothing there. We talk about the, the desire to move Broderick Jones over to left tackle. That's looking less and less likely outside cornerback depth this week. Slot corner has nothing right now. D line depth has to be addressed. Um, you know, inside linebacker depth could still be adding another guy to that mix right now you have queen and roberts as your likely starters holcomb's an unknown and then mark robinson he'd like to get one more you know i don't know backup level but somebody else in that mix uh maybe even safety depth still so to me there's still a bunch of holes on this roster that have not been addressed and i'm with you i thought we would have heard a bit more movement this week now something again probably can and will will occur but I think Pittsburgh still has some holes on this roster that if you go into the draft with all these issues, the draft alone probably won't solve them or you're counting on their rookie class to really make a big impact as they did in, in 2023. Maybe uh, 15 minutes after we get off of this podcast, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Omar Khan will turn the hose back on. <laughs> probably. I mean, uh, Friday to see Friday is kind of some more free agent signings end up kind of getting announced. So yeah. there's a chance of that happening. I, and look, it, it hasn't been an all, all uh, an awful haul so far. I just, you know, the at the rate this team was starting to spend cash coming out, you know, coming out of the shoot there, and 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 some of the moves, and and as you mentioned, still the holes are out out there. I kind of thought the back end of this week would have been a little bit busier. Look, I'm once again, I don't think that 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 we're headed headed for any more super lucrative deals when it comes to this. In fact, you know, I think we even said, you know, you might have one or two guys that, that, that bust that Larry Ogan, Joby APY, uh, uh, number at this point, looks like there might only be one, unless they trade for something, you know, uh, on, on the outside for half a minute there, it looked like Dante Jackson might be that guy. But as we also predicted too, they, they, they manipulated that contract in a hurry on top of it there. So, uh, 
in my opinion, there's still about another nineteen million dollars in 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 cash, and and that includes offsets and all as well too that this team could could spend. Are they even going to? That's that's a lot of money when you you know uh, overall at this point in free agency. You know, mm-hmm. will will they even get to that point? And let let me explain once again. You know what what we're talking about here in cash and offsets. Uh, what I did is I took the total of the the top fifty three man roster or the top fifty three contracts under contract at the time free agency uh, started. And if you if you add up all the cash that those players were were scheduled to make ahead of free agency here, and that includes base salary, roster bonuses, and all like that, you come up with a number. And then obviously as the uh, as free agency. Uh, goes on, and this includes your own free agents as, as as well too. As as someone added to the roster enters at fifty three, he obviously displaces somebody that you already had as as an expected cash expenditure there. And most of those numbers at the bottom have been nine hundred fifteen thousand dollars in cash, but it's still an offset of where the fifty three, the top fifty three were was. To where it is right now. Then once again, you look at at at, at the trade off of uh, Deontay Johnson for Dante Jackson. At this point, you had you were scheduled to pay Don, uh, Deontay Johnson ten million dollars in cash in 2024, and now you go to essentially trading that off for Dante Jackson, who now has a cash charge of six million. So you actually cr- created four million dollars in in, 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 in in cash that way there. And this even accounts for the three re-signings in Christian Kuntz in uh, 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 Montrevious Adams and Miles Killebrew on top of it there. So you're talking about after all, all, all offsets there, really just an increase of 21.6 million. And I kind of thought at this stage of the game here, we'd, we'd be 31 32 million. So I they are going to add more players to this roster. I'm I'm confident about that before the draft. But they're probably not going to be the higher dollar guys that that some people have wanted. Simply because most of those guys have already been signed. Right. I mean, who who are the best free agents available across the board right now? I mean, you talk at receiver, Tyler Boyd, we'll see what happens there. Those rumors have continued. Uh, Josh Reynolds, he's visiting in Baltimore. That's looking less likely for Pittsburgh, but we'll see. Obviously, Mike Williams never made it to them. Uh, I'm not even sure in other positions who are the best names out there. Center is very weak right now with so many of those guys being uh, signed and, and off the market. Corner. You know, I think we'll I think we'll see another corner signing something in the slot, like it. even if it's a Chandon Sullivan resign for a one year, one point five million. Something's going to happen there. They're not going to go into the draft with literally nothing at slot corner. Yeah, the way this wide receiver position and and look, I mean this this wide receiver group at least initially coming out of shoot felt felt pretty thick overall, especially for free agency. Look, you know. Uh, uh, the the prime guys never make it there, right? Because they either get franchised or re-signed mm-hmm. uh, uh, generally and all. But I thought as far as a free agent wide receiver uh, group goes, I thought this this was a fairly de- decent one. But now, you, now you're down to the point where, yeah, uh, I mean, Hunter Renfro, the Steelers have a little bit of a history going back to his pro day, right? Uh, uh, with him. Uh, uh, you know, Tyler Boyd obviously is a name that's being thrown around quite a bit. Uh, who else, Alex? I mean, again, there, I mean, Josh Reynolds has been speculated by Steeler fans. He's visiting the Ravens. It would make sense, but I don't, I don't know if the interest is there right now. Boy, Chenault, boy, if you could get him on a cheap deal to bring him to camp, that would be, that would be worthwhile. I think a guy that's, that, that never really, you know, didn't live up to kind of his initial billing, LaVisca Chenault, uh, mm-hmm. there. So, but look, any of these guys that you don't trade for at this point are, should come relatively cheap. And I, and no, I don't get the whole Odell Beckham thing that people are trying to connect the dots on. I, I mean, he's 32. Do you really want to, do you, at, do you really want to go down the path of a, you know, an older guy at this point? I don't want to personally. Uh-huh. And I think it's, I've only heard Mike Florio mention that. I'm not sure if it's really been talked about otherwise. Could somebody sit there and say they're just saving this money for the impending IUK trade? Could somebody pin, put their tinfoil hat on and, and, I mean, and try to claim that? 
Look, we we broke it down every 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 way that we could the other day. Uh, other than it busting, uh, you know, busting precedents with this organization would think, oh, they never do that. You know, uh, those kind of conversations outside of just not not being something historically that they do. Alex, I mean, there every other way fits. Well, let, let me ask you a, a different way. What is the minimum amount of cap space they need to trade for Brandon Ayuk and, and assume that initial salary before they extend him out? I mean, it 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 still works right now. Right, but how much? They're they're pretty close to the line, aren't they? Sure, but I mean, if you okay. have a if you have a sign and trade in 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 or a, a tr- uh, no, let me phrase that probably a I, it's a trade and sign <laughs> yeah it's got to be traded uh, before you sign them uh i mean 14.124 million is what you need and this and this team has uh what did i say uh 14.9 something so and then even with you you, you look at it you say oh, that's only eight hundred thousand dollars in in gap space well you can you can do a lot of veteran benefit <laughs> Contract signings with the offset and fit them on with within eight hundred thousand uh, in, in 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 cap space because once again you're dealing with the bottom of the rule of fifty one which I think right now is a nine hundred fifteen uh, thousand salary so that would be your 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 roster displacement top fifty one displacement point there so if you even brought in a guy that had a uh, one point three million dollar cap charge. You know, you, you, you're talking about, what, half a million dollar displacement right around in there that that, mm-hmm. that could still fit in there. But look, you're, you're not going to me. You're not going to trade for uh, uh, Brandon Ayuk unless you have that extension sure. in, in place. So, I mean, you're talking about two days max of putting the pen to the paper right. and, and, and making it a formality where it, it frees you back up cap space. And in my opinion, uh, you know, Based on the kind of contract that 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 Ayuk's likely looking for, I mean, you're going to take that 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 cap charge of fourteen point one probably down to somewhere like six or seven million. So you yeah. cut it in half and you're freeing it back up, you know, uh, on the back end. I agree completely. It's a temporary, you know, holding of that money because if you deal for him, you've probably already, already talked to his agent and essentially have worked out the contract and the language, and just have to get him in the building, pass a physical, read, you know, sign the deal, and 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 you're good to go. But if you wanted to, and I'm not saying this is the case, but if you wanted to really put on your tinfoil hat and say they are kind of holding steady right above that mark, because if they were to go sign somebody for four million dollars per year, and now they're they have. Thirteen million dollars in cap space. Now they have to do something before they could acquire Ayuk to to get compliant to be able to, to assume a salary. So it is a little curious. They are right above that Ayuk number <laughs> in this holding pattern for the past week. It it is it is, and and it's good to see that you've dusted off your tinfoil hat and, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and pulled it out for the offseason. And look, uh, we're just talking with what this team has has currently. In, in, in cap space, they can always restructure the cut, sure. you know, uh, and it, it, it's probably even written in his contract that they can restructure it when, when they want to. I think Joel Corey has mentioned that, uh, before to us in, 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 in passing before that sometimes, especially with the Steelers, they, they make sure that they have this at that, you know, as part of the original contract, uh, you know, kind of the ability to, to, to do that. And look, there's nothing to really be lost for a guy like uh, Alex Highsmith to do it. And he, explain that quickly. Some people still think that, that the player is hurt by that, or there's a pay cut. Explain how a restructure does not hurt a player's financial. Look, uh, he he's just, he's just getting the, the, and, and once again, when, when it comes to the Steelers and most restructures overall, there's a payment plan on these things anyway, a time frame of when that amount's going to be paid. So uh, I think the only, uh, uh, look, a, all a restructure is, a traditional restructure is taking the chunk of the uh, base salary that the player is set to be earned. And then a, you know, if they have any type of a roster bonus and all like that, uh, what you do is you're turning all of that money into a, another signing bonus so that you can prorate out for a cap for cap accounting purposes and lower his cap money. The player does not lose any money in the, in the whole shebang. And it's, and it's not, people think that, that the Steelers just write out one check. Well, uh, here's your, here's your, you know, what is Highsmith? 
uh, set to earn uh, this year here. Let me look real quick here. He has a uh, base salary of $10.733 million uh, overall here. And what you would be doing is turning all but the minimum uh, base salary amount allowed by the CBA into a signing bonus and then uh, prorating that out over the final. He's got four years left on his deal, including this year and, 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 and prorating that out. So it's not like you're going to him and saying, here's nine, here's a $9 million check, even though in their situation, they could probably write that for him. Normally mm -hmm. that that's in, you know, that's paid out in a, in, 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 in what 17, 18 uh, week as installments, just basically like his base salary is the player does not lose money on the deal when it, when it, when it comes to a restructure like this. Right. And that's just important to revisit. I know it's kind of cap 101, but just for people to understand uh, how those things work. And that's why some of them are just built into the contract to automatically happen. A team can do that at will because there is really no, in some sense, the player might get that money sooner than they would otherwise if it's uh, just part of their base salary. So um, just wanted to, to note that. But again, we'll see. More players will be added. Confident in that. But I do think it's still important to recognize my terrible take is on this today. Hopefully they don't sign somebody, so I don't have to redo the terrible take. But uh, I think there are still some you know, pretty significant holes on this roster that still must be addressed, addressed both in starter and in depth, offensively and defensively. I, 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 you want to you want another reason to put on your tenfold hat potentially here is sure. is 15 minutes after after we do the press conference, if somehow word <laughs> surfaces out uh, that that Highsmith has done his restructure to free up another seven point two oh, yeah. million dollars then then it's really time to put your tin tinfoil hat on that so because once again uh for you know almost 15 million dollars in cap space might not seem uh, like a lot to 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 people listening but at this stage of the off season and and look they're going as I've pointed out several times, you, you move past this part of the off season here and the forthcoming costs that they have to, you know, you, you projected 18.3 million that they've still got to work into this whole situation here. That's a lot of cap space, but it's not uncommon looking ahead past free agency and all like that as well either. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff that you afford later down the road and, and, and later on into, into the situation when, you know, when, 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 when an Alex Highsmith restructure would happen there's also the whole thing with Cam, uh with with uh with with cameron hayward as well mm -hmm. too you know uh an additional two years with no new money in in in, in 2024 that could potentially lower his cap hit by you know i, I projected somewhere between nine and ten million dollars uh uh if, if things go the way i i, I think that they, they, they will p potentially go with him and all but I I get I I have the same feeling as well too. It's funny that you're I, I I'm assuming your terrible take is exactly on this today is the fact that it's magic it's magically delicious how uh, <laughs> we just we just passed St Patrick's Day there uh, it's magically kind of appetizing there how the cap number that or the cap space that they have right now just just does allow you to sh right. to to shoehorn in that uh that that base salary of, of Brandon Ayuk there uh, I I'm not saying I'm just because I'm not <laughs> saying I'm, I'm I'm just saying but here once again the the biggest the biggest obstacle here you know if you follow this team closely as to a reason why it won't happen with brand Brandon Ayuk is the fact that you're talking about a lot of historical they don't do that get thrown out the window. Now rules are made to be to be broken, streaks are made to be broken. Uh but you want to talk about uh Omar Khan really putting his stamp on that's not the way we do things anymore. This would fit this on several levels because once again you would think that Brandon Brandon Ayuk's uh APY would shatter 18 million, right? Oh yeah, it should be in the twenties. All right, so you're talking about your new second highest pay, or your yeah, your new second highest paid player, uh, 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 APY on the roster, right behind TJ Watt. That that would be uh, for an outsider, just just something that you don't see uh, uh, when it comes to the Steelers. And you know, once again, trading, you know, 
trade, trading for a guy like that, this, there, there's several things that would lead you to believe there's no way the Steelers do this. But what has the old way of the Steelers doing things got them up and for since <laughs> since 2016 at least, you know, the last time they mm-hmm. won a playoff game. You know, so yeah. and if there's an offseason to do some things differently, it's this one because they've done a lot of things differently that we didn't expect. Right. So I understand why you dusted off your tinfoil hat. Let me ask you this. This would probably be a, a more difficult question to answer because there's a lot of projection here. Hypothetically, if they were to trade for Ayuk and, and they extended him out on whatever terms you think is, is plausible, what would his cash number be? This year, if you had to kind of take a guess <laughs> on that, <laughs> I got the Dave giggle. Pro, uh, well, and it was cap charge will be cut cut in half, but from a, from a cash standpoint, what would they pay him? Do you think if you had to yeah, count base salary signing bonus? I that that's that that's already kind of tickled me in 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 some spreadsheets as well too. Here, let me pull up this real quick. Here, I mean, look, he's obviously due fourteen point one. A million this year and he's going to get unless you did some you know you've got to lower that cap number down if you trade for him. oh yeah and they, will. they uh, will and they will so in other words he's going to get at least 14.1 million dollars in cash in 2024 now if, if his apy comes in let's say let's say how much is he worth 20 let's say 22 on the low side Okay, right, that's uh, fine. 22 million. And for him to sign the deal, and especially if you're not going to give him guaranteed money, see, that's going to be another sticking point with this sure. as well, too, is how much guaranteed money past 2024 uh, uh, does he get? And can you make that roster bonus in March of 2025 attractive enough where he says, look, I'm going to get it, you know? Uh, yeah, they did yeah. it with Queen. I mean, they did it with right, him. right. So let's say let's. What did I say? Uh, Twenty twenty two million. Uh, his yeah. his cash payment with him already due fourteen million one. You would have to think that he's going to get at least twenty two million, twenty three million dollars in cash in two thousand twenty four when it comes to uh, signing bonus and base salary. I mean that 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 would work with the numbers, all right. So let let's say it's a let's say it's a twenty three million dollar cash pay for him in two thousand and twenty four as part of an extension. Okay, well, how much cash does that put them at for the entire off season? Well, offset that by nearly a million because of him entering the mm-hmm. I don't want to call it a rule of fifty three because it's just a top fifty three. You're talking about twenty two million dollars roughly uh, 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 after displacement, and voila, you add that on to the other twenty two uh, million in cash that they've spent uh, since displacement. You know, including displacement so far. That puts you right in that forty-two million, <laughs> forty-two million dollars in 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 cash increase expenditure during free agency that I kind of envisioned this this team having this off season. So and it, you didn't it, you didn't pull that cash number out of, out of anywhere. That's based on the three year you know ninety percent rule and kind of where this team is is at and where they're probably headed. Yeah, look and 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 that. You know my cash, my cash expected spending in free agency this off season was based on what was it like ninety six or ninety per, you know, uh, a little bit lower than a hundred percent of the right. cap of the cap number in cash. There's nothing that prevents this team from spending a hundred percent of the cap number. I just and and I'm in foreign ter- territory because this is even though I predicted cash spending related to the cap last year, it was easier for me to do because it was the third year of the three year of the three year CBA cycle. It's a lot harder, at least from, from my, you know, learning and experience, it's a lot harder to predict the first year of a three year cycle because you just, I mean, it, it, you don't, there's, 
you don't have any standards to go off of and what they might have to make up. All we know is that teams over a three-year period have to spend 90 per, at least 90% of the three-year total of the league's cap in cash. So right. But I, you should be in the ballpark. Like You have I, some parameters to work with. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to think that I do, but, yeah. you know, goes back to what Jim Morris said, said in that old clip. You don't you you think you know, but you don't know. You know, I I I envision, you know, let me go back to my post here from from pre free agency here and I can tell you exactly kind of what I envisioned this team doing in cash versus the uh the, 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 the cash here. And this I wrote this on March the tenth. Okay. Uh where is my percentage here? I mean, I- you should be again in the area. We don't that number that you projected probably won't hit dead on in the right. first year because there's more 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 wiggle room. But you're not going to be off by I don't think a dramatic amount, and they probably will be lower this year in that first year than maybe they would be maybe in a third year where they kind of really have more defined number and target to hit. Hey, here's what I ended the post with. Basically, I could see the Steelers spending. 90 to 94 percent of the 2024 cap total in cash that boils down to free agency cash spending equaling out to a range of 35 million to 45 million in cash uh you know in cash offset you know uh mm-hmm. there so I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, long story short it magically that a uh, Brandon Ayuk new contract, because that would be the byproduct of a free agency move, right? I mean, it's not a tra- it's yeah. not it's not a traditional go out and sign this guy in 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 in, in free agency. But it's, it's, an a, it's, a, it's an addition. It's an addition. It's an addition, right? So, the numbers match. Does it mean it's going to happen? No, obviously. I think compensation will still be a tricky to figure out what the San Francisco want. I think you're seeing that with Legarius Le- Sneed in Kansas City. Why he's still a cheap? Because I think the, the word is the money's less of the issue. The compensation is more of the issue. I still think Ayuk would not go for a first round pick. I think a second round pick and something else is more likely. But there are still obviously a lot of obstacles, and we're spending a lot of time talking about this thing that certainly. May not happen, but it, but it is funny to see kind of the numbers in 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 some large sense align. Look, I I didn't know we were going to go back down this right. You know, we this did wasn't covered in our uh, <laughs> uh, production meeting prior to, prior to this podcast here. But uh, you know, coming out coming out of our conversation the other day and talking about the plausibility of 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 them trading for Iuk. Once again, getting past the narratives that they don't, you know, this historically would be a big deal from what they've done in the past. I I really think the hardest thing to 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 figure out here is the compensation. What do you think the compensation? If you had to take a guess right now, I know it's a guess, but if you had to guess compensation, I'll, I'll give my answer. But but what do you think it would take? You know, I, I tell you what I think Omar's doing here. I okay. I I think. Now this is just me, and and I might be wrong on this. I definitely don't think Omar wants to give up a first round pick as part of any of this. All right, sure. uh, uh, I think that he knows the 49ers want to dump. I, I and and dump is a a drug. Don't just get him out of the bit. He's. I don't think they're, they they're open dump. to trade. They're open they're, to listening. Right. They want to move on for him because of financial reasons, because they're not going to be able to satisfy his needs. Mm-hmm. Dump is, is, is viewed as a derogatory term. And I don't mean it in, 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 sure. in this sense here. Uh, I think they know that they, that the 49ers would like to get him moved on from this off season here. I, I really think Omar's trying to get them to take a third and something else here. Really, you think a third, not even a second? I, I really, really, and and you know, I, I've been wrong in the past. I it could be. We'll see what Ayuk ends up going for and all like that. But I really think now this could this might be some sort of package thing, and you know, uh, maybe a maybe a third this year and a third next year. I I don't know. But as far as this year's draft picks go and knowing Omar's history so far, brief history, when it comes to these deals, I bet he's really trying to angle as this, this, the, the, uh, the high end of compensation, at least in 2024 being a third rounder. 
And he's got some time here. I think the 49ers would want something resolved before the draft. So if they traded IU, they could go out there and draft one of these, you know, talented receivers uh, with a, you know, day two type of pick. Um, but there's no need to do it right this second. Um, what, what, what you said you had your idea. What's your yeah, idea? My idea. And again, we're all just kind of guessing here in, in having to extend him, you know, plays a factor. I think that will hurt the 49ers leverage to an extent. But I my my projection is Pittsburgh would have to trade fifty one their second round pick and I'll say ninety eight their latter the two third round picks for Ayuk and they would get back I'll call it a fifth round pick I believe Forty Nine ers have one seventy six overall to get Pittsburgh a fifth round pick because they have no no current pick okay. there that's very late in the fifth round I think it's actually the last pick in the fifth round but it would be something in return so that's my that's my guess I think I'd be in the ballpark, but Pittsburgh giving up 51 and 98 for Ayuk and 176. Here's the, here's, here's an interesting, man, we are going, doing, we are, I don't know how long this is going to end up running here. And hopefully this is entertaining to, 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 to discuss something that might not ultimately happen here, but rewind back to the whole Justin Fields thing. All right. Mm-hmm. You, you knew a play, you knew he was going to get dealt, right? Yes. All right. And then slowly as time went along, the 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 compensation de- deteriorated where there was all where we watched it. We thought, how many teams mm-hmm. can possibly be involved at this point? All right. Now it it it, it it's sort of the same, but it's different, you know, situation with IU. And also we're under the assumption, and that's dangerous at this point, we're under the assumption that the 49ers ha- I don't want to use have to, but it, it, it's the best thing that fits in, in, in this narrative. They, they essentially have made the decision that they're probably going to move on from him. So how many teams at this point are, you know, have, have factored in the possibility, not that teams can't shift on the fly and all like that, but people, you know, te- people got to understand teams map this stuff out, you know, as far as ca- cash spending and cap, uh, uh, relegation and class uh, of the draft and all that, you know, this is a lot deeper than just two guys, two Steeler fans talking about it on a podcast, thinking that they <laughs> thinking that they have a good idea how this goes. Right. I mean, this, sure. this, this is business folks, <laughs> you know, this, this goes deeper than what, what, what we think that we know on this. So within that, you know how many how many teams might actually be in play for Iuk now? And once again, the 49ers have got to understand that the onus is on another team. You know because you could trade for this guy, he get your building and say, "I'm not signing the deal." Right, but again, we assume if a deal were to happen, the the, the Niners will get permission to talk to the sure. agent, and the deal will essentially be worked out before a trade is officially agreed upon. Sure, but at its core, you're trading away a player that's got that that that's entering the final year of his contract. And there is some offset because of that, I think, as far as compensation goes. Yeah, I agree in, in, in principle, but if the extension is agreed upon, I think it becomes a moot point. And whatever leverage you might have had there really is not gonna not gonna work. Right. But but once again, the to me, at least at least from thirty thousand foot view, the 49ers have you know got them. You know they obviously are, don't want to get robbed in this situation, but they're at some point they might have to take the best deal that's on the board. I I, I get that, and I think they understand the situation that that Ayuk is not in their long term plans. That's why they're looking to potentially deal him because they have so much money invested elsewhere. But it's not like Fields because you can play Ayuk. They're not intending on drafting a receiver in the first round. I mean, you know, with, with Chicago, they're going to draft Caleb Williams. Justin Fields is not going to start for them. You can't coexist Williams and Fields. It's a weird dynamic. You have to move on from him. the Niners could sit there and say, well, we'll just hold on to IU and become a Super Bowl contender and try to make another run at this thing. That's not a bad, you know, downside to holding on to IU for this season. So I don't think the situation is completely comparable in that sense. Okay. I, I, but Omar also wants to make the best deal possible, obviously. Right, uh, and he's uh, gotten good deals. He knows how to work the deal to his right. credit. So, okay, how many teams do you think could potentially be in play right now for 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 Iuk? 
Well, I, I think it's a valid point because talk about what, what does interest mean? That can mean a phone call, but in terms of how many teams are actually offering you that a have the, the cap space to, and the willingness to, to sign this guy long-term and offer you, you know, draft compensation, it's never that many teams. It's not seven teams offering right. you deals. It, you know, seven may call and ask you about what's his availability, what's contract look like, you know, what are you guys thinking about in return? You may get two at three max teams actually offering you here is what we'll give you draft pick wise. Will you accept this deal? It's not going to be a large number of teams. It never is. Right. Man, we really put on, we, we uh, have gotten the use out of the tenfold hats today. <laughs> yeah. uh, Money guaranteed on that. Look, there's, sure. a, there's, you know, there's a high percentage chance that all this was for nothing. <laughs> but I mean, I, I can't remember a time where I've given this much thought and credence and, and plausibility to a high for a trade for a high dollar player at this point of an off season when it comes to the Steelers. Yeah. And frankly, it's a slower Friday. Um, we were under an hour. So I figured let, let, let's talk about it because maybe by Monday, a bunch of stuff happens, even non IUK related. And we're busy talking about something else. So just something else to explore. The numbers are interesting. We'll see what happens. Look at its core. Once again, you know, everything fits except for the fact that, man, you, this would be monumental historically when it comes to how the, how the Steelers deal with play, players outside, you know, outside the organization. And really, uh, you know, I don't want to call it free agency because you're trading for a player, but th- this would be pretty monumental if they did something. This would be what I, what I, I mean, this would be a, uh, a needle mover. For this, oh, yeah. the, the, yeah. the, the, this off season. And, and again, the reason why I even entertain the idea far more than usual with these kinds of things are it is the sense of urgency Pittsburgh seems to be working with uh, their desire to to produce and to win now and to win a playoff game. And you've just upgraded your quarterback room. You don't want to sit there come December and say, man, I wish we would have had a better wide receiver opposite of Pickens. This rookie we have is slow to come along and they're trying to work on things and get used to the NFL. Like you, you just acquired, you know, Wilson and Fields. You want to give those guys talent to throw to and really feel like you've done everything you can to maximize your offense without any sort of what if, what if we made this move to improve our offense back in the spring would that have changed things in the fall? I think Pittsburgh really wants to do everything in their power to make this offense at least, at least average from a points per game standpoint, but hopefully better than that. And and you know, how does this draft class play into Iuk's value as well? Too, that's something else. I mean, we've talked about what uh, what a and you know, probably half the people listening to this are saying, "Hell no, I don't want to trade for him and give him that kind of." Uh, uh, money. Okay. I, I, I get it. I get it. And if people are saying, man, why not just go into the draft and draft a guy? The difference is, is, you know, are, are, is any player guaranteed in the draft? No. Uh, mm-hmm. especially maybe specifically one that you, that you want, like in need as the Steelers like to say there second, right. even if you got that, that player, how much, at least you know what Iuk is, and you can kind of rubber stamp what he's done, how he fits in your offense, and probably to some level of certainty outside of injury, kind of predict what he's going to give to your offense. It's more of a projection, obviously, when you're talking about a young guy coming into the league as a rookie. Yeah, he might ultimately be good and better, even better than Iuk, but are you going to be able to get that instant impact out of him right away? Right less likely to happen. The The upside is, of course, you have the guy under contract. He's cheap. He's a little bit younger, but Ayuk is only 26. The age is not a, a big concern. But yeah, I mean, it, again, it goes back to that idea of, well, you hope Xavier Leggett can become Brandon Ayuk. We'll just trade for Ayuk then. That's kind of the school of thought. Right. Uh, look, nobody other than maybe you at this point has taken this thing out of the, taken, 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 taken this out of the box and tried to look at it from every angle, you know, as possible. And I get the pushback for, for those listening that say, hell no, don't trade for them and pay them that kind of money. And, and especially with this draft class, I get it, but let mm-hmm. me tell you this. I, and, and I've heard all these other names bantered around with the, uh, and look, Terry, Mc, uh, uh, 
Terry, Scary Terry with Washington, I, I'm a huge fan of him coming out and all, but he is older as well, too. And uh, it's a lot, it would be a lot harder, you know, to to, a con, to to not only deal for him, but accommodate the contract because of him already. It's not like you, I mean, you could turn around and restructure him, I guess, if you wanted to, but also his cap number, you, you would have to turn around, you, you know, you'd have to either cut somebody or restructure Highsmith's contract because I think Terry's number is like 15 something million uh, there. So, I mean, could you go down the route of trading for some of these other wide receivers? Uh, sure you could, uh, but it, it's just a different dynamic when you come to age and, and, and cap. is the player available? We don't, McLaurin yeah, we don't. sound like he's on the block. Like Ayuk, we know there's interest potentially for him to be dealt. Right here, 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 here. Here's the thing: when it comes to him, as well, too, they they just paid a two million dollar roster bonus to him. You know, right. so, I mean, we we assumed they did, and didn't push it back, and all like that. You know, so uh, you're lighting that money on a fire if you trade him away two weeks later. Yeah, you you would think that if you had if you had serious intentions on 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 trading him, that that would have done been done before you know, early in free agency before his, for his roster bonus matured there. Like Look, Deontay. Right, right. There's two or, I mean, there's obviously two or three other receivers out there that, and, and once again, Terry's up there in age, whereas you get the factor of, of how old I, is McLaurin? Is he older? I guess he's older. Uh, is he 28. Yeah. No, I, mean, I, I believe you. I, I, is he pushing 30? Am I, I that old? He, I thought he's pushing 30. Yeah. He's gonna be 29 in September. God. I remember him coming out. We, yeah. yeah, you said you, you were a big fan of him. We are we are getting all so very old days. I know. I don't know where time's gone. It seemed like yesterday <laughs> you're watching him making those incredible cuts. What at the Senior Bowl? I thought right, it? right, you know? yeah, for sure. But uh, you know, look, my my view is if there is one receiver that this team is enter, entertaining trading for, it would it would be uh, uh, Brandon Ayuk. Makes sense. So we'll see where it goes. No idea. You know, if it happens, I think it'll be before the draft, but that's a still pretty large time frame from now until then. All right. All right, Dave, anything else here? Get us out of the Ayuk rabbit hole. Any other topics we have not covered? We have Joe Clark at the Boston College Pro Day today. And he says Bronson Williams, one of their scouts uh, from Pittsburgh, is at the uh, the workout. So he's on hand to cover that. Hopefully get some quotes and some information on what's happening up in BC. All right, let's get to some emails, Alex. And close out today's show. All right. Uh, Nathan Casey writes in, Dave and Alex, you guys do great work on the pod and on the site. Why shouldn't the Steelers make a push for Justin Simmons with the market being so depressed? A chance to have a pair of all pro safeties on the back end for the next two to three years is too good to pass up. Even though he is more of a free safety, they can figure it out. Elliot can be their third safety and they can cut Casey, he says. Also, why can't they say they are comfortable with uh, Daniels at center next year? He is 6'4", 300 pounds. This is a great size for a center, not great for a guard. Even if they plan uh, to draft a guard, isn't it in their best interest for the league? for the league to think that they can roll into this season with what they have and why not move him? Okay. And not basically another Daniels to center question, uh, and be an upgrade over Cole last year. Finally, we, uh, are we shortchanging the signing of a punter? Had the Steelers had at least a ball control offense. That wasn't so many three and outs and a consistent, not well below average punter. They would have done significantly better last year. Look, uh, uh, uh having a better punter certainly would have helped last year. I, I mean, would that have been worth another win? I don't know. It wouldn't have, wouldn't have beat the Bills in the playoff game. That's all I all I really think about, I guess. But but I mean, listen, I I love I love them getting a better punter. I'm all for right. it. I mean, I'm 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 geeked over here, so I'm not downplaying it uh, one bit. Look, I, I I I'm not I'm not underselling uh, the addition of of a punter, and hopefully we we have it. I mean, nobody got more excited than than than, than Alex Kazora did. Yeah, had a film room the next day, so yeah, I. Punter is huge for sure to have just consistency, more varsity punts. That's a game changer. All right. Uh, the whole Justin Simmons thing. Here's the thing. I, I, I will say this about the safety position where the Steelers uh, are, are, are right now. The uh, the Elliott contract at a three million APY. All that means is for right now, he looks to be the starter. But you you could definitely upgrade from that. 
you know, would it be a guy like Justin Simmons? You have to, if I'm Justin Simmons, I'm, I'm still trying to hold out hope that I can get a pretty decent deal here for starters. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, you know, the market is, as the reader said for safety is typically on the more depressed and lower side. If they did it, it's hard to be mad at that. It's just, you know, we talked about not really sure the fit. He is about to be 31 later this year. You're trying to get younger with your safety group and your secondary, your defense overall still can play obviously. So wouldn't hate that, but you know, I, I I'm good with what they did to get a defined you know, strong safety in Elliott, even though his play is, you know, probably average just to have that clear box guy to free up Minka more. I think it's the really important component of it. So, you know, if they want to add Simmons, fantastic, but I'm, I'm good with what they did. It was just a kind of a, a lower level, but necessary move to, I think, have a cleaner division of labor between free safety, strong safety, and to, again, I think, free up Minka to play like the old Minka. Right, I agree. Uh, and what would you say about uh, the uh, another suggestion about Daniels? Yeah, I, I'm happy with him at guard. He has not played center in a long time. I'm not sure how much he's even done it at the NFL level. I know he did at Iowa. Um, I know Omar Khan shot down the idea. I mean, Daniels has, has gotten better at guard. You sign him to play right guard, keep him at right guard. I don't want to move him and then have to go find a right guard and move, you know, the, the just trying to find different people for different spots, you know, just, just go find a center. There are centers in this class for the draft that are talented, that will be available. They can get somebody if they want to, that is not the concern. Uh, Nick Shuley writes in about Cooper DeGene out of uh, Iowa, Uh, Alex and Dave. I have no problem admitting that Iowa's Cooper uh, DeGene is my draft crush. Pause. Uh, his ball skills and ability to return punts make me think he'd be a solid fit for the Steelers. I read he has a workout schedule for April 15th. This leads me to two questions. Do you think the, the Steelers scouts, coaches, Tomlin and Khan will attend? Number two, do you think he could be their guy in the first round? It The further we get into this, it feels like they aren't as big on Cooper as maybe most fans are. It's a little hard to tell because of the injury. Um, I don't know in terms of the workout. I don't think typically a lot of the brass will attend for that. Obviously, the film will get sent out to each team if they want to just take a look at how he's moving. Um, so, you know, my guess is that's less likely to occur, but we'll see. We'll see what happens at his workout and who may be there and who may not be there. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I, I agree with what you said there. Let's see here. What else we have in the email machine? Uh, still pastor. Oh, this is a loan from still pastor. He's sent it in for a couple times. He, uh, he, he has a long NFL terms used in player contracts. He's asking about understanding the contracts of Russell. He says, I have a question about terminology when used in contract discussions in particular, I would like to come to a better understanding of the contracts for quarterback, Russell Wilson. A number of sources seem to conflate his closing contract with Seattle with his new contract renegotiated with Denver. Could you please clarify terms like salary cap hit, dead money, et cetera? People seem to be bashing Seattle. However, to me, they appear savvy. On the other hand, Denver seems to be an earlier version of the Browns quarterback fiasco. Denver seems to have paid way too much to Seattle and negotiated with themselves when come they're uh, coming to terms with Wilson on his deal. Am I missing something? There is something obviously more. To, look, I, it, I'm not going to go down there. I, I understand maybe where you're coming from, uh, Joe there, but uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here researching what his contract was with Seattle versus what, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. Can you give me an, a better idea why we're going down this rabbit hole first and foremost? I mean, to me, it, it all sounds like a kind of a, 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 a moot point at this point, you know, the, the, the Seahawks wanted to get rid, rid of Russell Wilson you know, looking back, obviously the, the, the Broncos overpaid with what they gave. And then not only that, they, 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 they overpaid with, 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 with giving him a contract. Yeah. I'm not sure if you said, mentioned bashing Seattle people are, I, I have not heard that. I think the deal was a clear win for them. There's a lot of bashing in, in Denver, but I've not heard about that in Seattle. And that's all years ago and not really relevant for his time in Pittsburgh right now. 
Ah, uh, boy, this other one's long here too, and we're we're up against it here. Uh, with, with, as the time factor goes, so uh, send in. Yeah, look, if, if we've missed your question here, sorry, Pastor uh, Pastor Joe, but I mean, I, I I just don't understand the rabbit hole and what what we're looking to do there to warrant p- trying to dig for the contract for Russell Wilson that you know he had coming out of Seattle and. I mean, we, we, we know Denver's taking a hell of a amount, amount of uh, dead cap money uh, split over a couple of years here when it comes to to, to, to turning Russell Wilson uh, loose. So I'm, I'm just I'm just struggling with with what we're after here, I guess, overall. Uh, if you've sent in an email question and we have yet to answer it and it's still relevant, try to work it back in uh, through uh, the email machine here. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. You got anything else to add out before we get out of here? No, have a good weekend. I'll come back on Monday. All right. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex at, uh, Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at terrible podcast. Email the show, the terrible podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, Steeders Depot.com, hit the donate button up, right? Navigational bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, Steeders Depot.com, hit the ad free button up, right? Navigational bar. Uh, obviously we'll be back over the weekend. If something, really uh, extravagant happens here with this team. If not, we'll be back on Monday. So as always, thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with Dave and Alex.